David Horn is going to. Dr. David is going to bring us the first of our new sermon series on the I Am Sayings of Jesus. So, um, this morning it's I Am the Alpha and the Omega. So, um, Sally, thank you. Today's Bible reading is from Revelation 1, 12, 18, and 22, 12, 13. I turned round to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash round his chest. The hair of his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze, glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look. I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. This is the word of the Lord. Are we wired? Yes, we are. Lovely. Okay. Before we go any further, let's pray, shall we? So, Lord Jesus, we really want to see you this morning. We want you to be front and centre. We want you, um, Lord, to be lifted up. That's our intention. Be among us, please. Amen. Amen. So, I'd like to start by telling you something about my mum. (laughs) You see, my mum, she never went to church in her younger days at all, full of hypocrites, you see, as far as she was concerned. So her early years in the Welsh Valleys were the dying embers of uh, of the 1904 Welsh Revival. Um, Did you know that in Cardiff, in the capital city of Wales, in 1905, the following year, there was one recorded crime just one but by the time my mum was born in the 1920s uh, the fervor had sort of long since cooled and the passion had sort of fossilized into into rigid rules you know so you had to go to church three times on a sunday and they actually chained up the park swings as disincentive to uh, to staying out of church and she, would know, she knew of a local preacher who would cry tears of passion and thump the pulpit and go home and thump his wife as well. Nevertheless, she sort of clung on to a, a sort of a respectful belief in God and the family moved to Reading. In the meantime, my dad moved from Suffolk, so east is east and west is west, but the twain did meet on a dance floor in Reading, and they married in 1955 in, in Greyfriars Church. And Judith and I have a, a photo of ourselves married in the same church outside the south door, uh, virtually identical to theirs many years earlier. Well, my sister came along in double quick time. Uh, there was no crash in those days, and they didn't go back for 20 married years, and, uh, and I never went to church when I was a youngster. So no kids club for me. And when she did go back, it was in the middle of trouble. Now I was at that point about 14, there or thereabouts, and my mum slipped a disc. 
And she ended up flat on her back in bed for weeks because that's how you dealt with it in those days. Um, and in desperation, she turned to the Bible for comfort. She managed to get hold of one. Um, and she would read it. She would read Isaiah of all books. And then when the family walked in, if I walked into the bedroom, the Bible was nowhere in evidence because she'd actually hidden it under the pillow or the bedclothes in case we thought she was nuts. So unfortunately, time didn't really heal her back. Um, so many months later, a neurosurgeon at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London uh, actually operated successfully, but post-op, she made her way down to uh, the hospital chapel to a service, and inexplicably, every time the name Jesus cropped up in the hymn, she burst into tears. You see, she was really comfortable with the idea of God, but my mum had no idea where Jesus fitted into the whole thing. For her, that was the start of a quest to find him, and find him she did eventually. So here's the point, that today too, many people have got little idea of who Jesus really is. See, people are generally quite comfortable outside to sort of reference God. You know, and you see football players after they scored a goal, careering round and pointing to the sky. Uh, people go all coy, sometimes even hostile, when you mention the name of Jesus. But inside these walls, we, of all people, need to understand who Jesus is. So today is the start of a new mini-series on what Jesus is said about himself. So you'll see some of his statements on those slides, and they're often just known as the I am statements of, uh, of Jesus. There are seven of them, and they are all found in John's gospel. Each one of them tells us something important and different about Jesus, and hopefully between now and Easter, your view of Jesus will grow, whether you've been in the faith for five days or 50 years. That said, Today is actually the exception. It's slightly different. You might have noticed that we didn't read in John's Gospel. We read from the book of Revelation. That's the very last book of the Bible. It has a reputation for being difficult, but actually parts of it are not at all difficult. And they are sometimes, Revelation is occasionally known as the fifth Gospel. Have you ever heard that term? Because like the other four, it contains the unique words of Jesus. Uh, anyone got a, um, a red letter Bible at home? They're not uncommon. Anyone got a red letter Bible? Pads has got a little finger in and a nick of, uh, so got a little red letter Bible. So um, the words of Jesus are placed in red to emphasize their importance, really, to modern disciples but actually you're gonna you see a lot of red in revelation as well i just it was just cycle through some pictures if the pa is working the the kind of red doesn't show up all that well in on in, but uh, but you might be able to make it out if you're not partially red green color blind like me so there's some black there's plenty of of red there so we actually had two little clips of, from Revelation today with two extra statements from the lips of Jesus, two extra I ams. And they're actually important. They're going to be the foundation for really for what I'm going to say a little bit later. But I'm going to ask you to connect some dots with me. So... Here's a, a statement from a few verses before. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty, past, present, future. So who said that? Well, that's the one that we know as Father God who is and who was and who is to come is an echo 
of the name by which God introduced himself to Moses. I am who I am can equally well be translated, I have been who I have been, past tense, I will be who I will be, future tense. It's a very clever name that encapsulates God's eternal existence. Um, well, that little verse up there starts just four verses before the first passage. And at the end of the first passage, we read this. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forever and ever. So who's speaking now? Well, who was dead and is now alive? Well, that's Jesus. So you've got the first and the last spoken by God, the Father, and the first and the last as spoken by Jesus. And you might think, well, titles are a little bit different, but actually it's not the only place where first and last is used. So we're going to have a little look at uh, another verse from Isaiah be one of the ones that my mum read, actually. This is what the Lord says. Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. And when you see Lord in capital letters, L-O-R-D, in the Old Testament, you are reading the divine name that no Jew felt free to pronounce in over 2,000 years. First and last is a title that God the Father claims as his unique privilege. And yet we've just seen Jesus use it. So what's the difference between first and last and Alpha and Omega? Nothing. It's the same title with the same status Jesus is given the same titles as his father. He even shares his father's throne. And if that isn't convincing enough, here's another little short passage that we finished with when Sally came up to read from the end of Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end if you read the context, it's the one who's coming soon, and that's Jesus. So what's our conclusion? Uh, what I've just proved to you is that Jesus shares his father's titles, that Jesus, being the first and the last, has no beginning and no end, that Jesus is therefore eternal, that he is therefore uncreated unlike any angel and lastly that Jesus qualifies as God along with the Holy Spirit now here is a diagrammatic representation of the Trinity you might have seen that just to talk you through it the father looking around the perimeter is not the son who is not the Holy Spirit who is not the father but the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Got that? And here's the appropriate response. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, that's just, you know, it's contradictory and irrational. Don't patronize me with such an absurd idea, David. Okay. Fine, but are you aware of the highly illogical and apparently completely unreasonable ideas that modern science sells us? So here's a little short list for you to think about. So first idea is that everything came from nothing. How illogical is that? That light waves can act as particles called photons, but particles can also be waves depending on whether they're being watched or not. That's a real physics experiment. That electrons have distant interconnected twins that could be on the other side of the universe. I joke you not. 
and that there are 10 or 11 dimensions, an extra six or seven compared to the, the kind of the three that we know that make up space and the fourth being time. But one theory, I only just discovered this when I was researching it, is that there are 26 dimensions. That's called bosonic string theory, way above my pay grade, I'm afraid. So, but it's science, is the universe is a weird place. Why would we necessarily worry or sweat about the idea of a God who is one in three? Now, it is true that the word Trinity is found nowhere in the Bible, but it runs through, that concept runs through the Bible like a stick of rock. And we're left kind of following the breadcrumbs to piece that together. But why isn't God just clear about it? Well, I think it's this. Because God won't allow himself to be defined. He's so far above and beyond what my tiny brain can conceive. You know, he bans us from making images. That's the second of the Ten Commandments, at least partly for that reason. So any attempt to depict and define him confines him, distorts and shrinks him. Now, I, I know that I've just appealed to your heads. I know that. But although there is value in that because Jesus exhorts his disciples to worship him with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. But we do, of course, have hearts as well as heads. So here's what I'm hoping that you'll really take away and hide in your heart, even if you forget every single word that I've spoken up to now. Because there are practical consequences to Jesus being the first and the last. And here they are. Firstly, it means that he is always with you. Grasp that. He's with you at the start. He was with you at your birth. He'll be there at the finish, at your death. But he's also there at every point in between. It's not for nothing that he's known as Emmanuel, God with us. And that means God with you too. Sometimes it feels like God sort of disappears. And you may not sense him for stretches of time. But the reality is, of course, that our experience is subjective. And every time our personal skies cloud over, and they inevitably do, do you conclude that he isn't there? Or that he doesn't care? No. Neither of those. So unless you know that you've given him cause to back away, in those quiet periods, he's just waiting to see what you do next. And he will respond to your response. That's called a relationship, isn't it? You know, if I talk to Sarah, Sarah responds to me, and then depending on what she said, I'm responding to her. That's a relationship, or at least a conversation. And he's always with you. He will always be faithful. He's always true. He always has been and he always will be. Someone once said that, uh, that God's name could be translated always. Because he's always there. Always with you. Past, present, future. Second thing is, he's always for you. You know, as a parent who is always for their children, that's the second consequence of his eternal nature. Jesus entered the world on the most audacious rescue mission ever devised. His reward was to be hated and rejected for it, suffer a slow 
agonizing death and it was for you. Life may be rough, but how is he not for you in the light of all of that? So even if parental discipline were necessary, and some of you got kids, some of you have got lots of kids. Discipline just proves that you love your kids or you wouldn't bother, would you? Now, not that all difficulties that crop up in life mean that you've done something wrong. That's not true. And thirdly, he is constant. You see, Jesus is not a victim of cultural fashion. He doesn't age. He doesn't get old. He doesn't have sick days. He is never incapable. He's the rock of ages. He isn't fickle or capricious. He doesn't have random bad moods. He isn't up one minute and down the next. He's totally consistent, which is unlike us. Uh, why not emulate him and get out of lava lamp mode? You know what I mean by lava lamp mode? It's quite hypnotic, isn't it? You see these little balls of color rise to the top and then they fall down and there's another one that rises. And we're like that to one degree or another a lot of the time. How can you be more resilient? Well, build resilience by getting yourself into Scripture. Have you ever noticed, though, that, that Scripture... Uh, even when it's talking, giving you a whole life story of someone like Abraham, or um, most of their lives happened between the paragraphs. Have you ever noticed that? It's edited highlights. Did God forget those people in between times? No. So Abraham and Deborah and Ruth and David and Thomas and Mary Magdalene, large chunks of their lives that aren't described. God was still there. He didn't leave them. And he won't forget you either. Never underestimate Jesus. I'm going to finish with a clip. I know some people will have seen this before. I personally never tire of it. Uh, probably most of you won't, I think. But we'll, that's what we'll do now. He's a king of the Jews. He's a king of Israel. He's a king of righteousness. He's a king of the ages. He's a king of heaven. He's a king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him. My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a wellspring of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a 
highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is lighter. I wish I could describe him, for yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! wonder, do you know him? And if so, do you love him? Is he first and last to you? If not, take a leaf out of my mum's book and start your quest. So no one gets to do that for you. One at a time, one on one, just you. <laughs> 